Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up a Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt. We have several types. There's our general Great Detectives t-shirt at t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. Our uh, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Anniversary t-shirt at yourstruly.greatdetectives.net. And our Joe Friday Never Said Just the Facts Ma'am t-shirt at friday.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The first aired episode of John Lund's Run is actually missing, but that was uh, essentially a remake of the story that was uh, done as the serial audition, so we didn't miss too much. Today's program actually aired December the 5th of 1952, and this one is The James Clayton Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Chet Graham, Johnny. Who? Wake up, boy. Chet Graham claims New York Mutual. Oh, hi, Chet. How are things? Bad. Johnny, I have to make a little trip out to the coast on a phony claim. I'll be gone about four days, but I need someone to hold down my office while I'm away. Can you do it? Oh, that's not my line, Chet. You know that. Well, make it your line, Johnny. Somebody has to be here. Look, you can live in my apartment. You can use my tickets to wish you were here... You can even take my girl if you want. New York's swell this time of year. Can't you get anybody there? Oh, everybody's got the flu or busy or something. When do you want to leave for the coast? I'd like to get out on the noon plane today. Well, I can be down there by 11. Good. We'll probably miss each other, but just walk right in the office and make yourself at home. I'll call you from L.A. Have a good trip. Uh, by the way, what does your girl look like? Even your best dream was never that good. Just leave her phone number on your desk. <laughs> John Lund, in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to New York Mutual Underwriters Limited, Rockefeller Center, New York City. Attention, Mr. Chester Graham, claims and adjustments. Dear Chet, you probably read some of this in the Los Angeles papers, but they don't have the whole story. Maybe they'll never get it all. I hope not. I found out part of it, stumbled into the rest of it, and I'm trying to forget all of it. The following is an accounting of expenditures during your four-day absence and my investigation of the James Clayton matter. Expense account item one, $14.35 transportation Hartford to New York, where, as per your advice, I walked in your office, sat down, and made myself at home. And where, 15 minutes later, I had a caller. Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. The girl at the reception desk said Mr. Graham was out of town and that you were taking his place. Yes. Please sit down. Well, thank you, but I don't have time. I'm Miss Stebbins, Dr. James Clayton's nurse. He asked me to see you. I see. He gave me these policy numbers. He said that your company wrote these policies and that he'd like to talk to one of you. Well, certainly, Miss Stevens. He can come by any time. No, you don't understand. Dr. Clayton can't get away from the office. We're terribly rushed, and I really should be getting back myself. He's there all alone. Well, do you know what it's about, Miss Stevens? I... No. The doctor's been acting strangely all day. He had me cancel all of his outside calls, and then he sent me here. He said to explain that it was very urgent. I'm... I'm very concerned for him. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform and cape was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced out a wan, unprofessional smile, and started to cry. I pretended not to notice all this as we got on the elevator and went down into the street. However, ten minutes later, when we arrived at a suite of offices in the Pelroy building, I had to notice Dr. James Clayton. He met us at the door. Most of his costume was medically correct, white coat and carrying a stethoscope in one hand. But in the other, he brandished a thirty-two Ivor Johnson. The safety was off. Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, doctor. 
This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance office. Claims investigation? Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh, Jane, this would be a good time for you to get some lunch, don't you think? Well, Doctor, I have all of those lab reports to No, go ahead, Jane. Like a good girl, I want to speak with Mr. Dollar alone. Of course, Doctor, if you say so. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Very fine girl, Jane. She's worked for me a long time. Very fine. Do you always meet her at the door with firearms, Doctor? Oh, oh, this. Well, all I can say is this is a ridiculous mess. My life's been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. This, I, I, I don't even know how to load it. <laughs> I look foolish, I suppose. A threat on your life, Doctor, comes under the heading of police business. I know that very well. And I would go directly to the police, only... Well, it is a delicate matter. You seem dubious already. No, just curious. Go on, please. <clears throat> well, several months ago, I attended a patient named Florence Harmon... A thorough examination disclosed that her poor physical condition wasn't based on any organic disorder, but rather upon an emotional instability. Now, this, I finally discovered, was brought about by her marriage to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Benjamin Harmon. I could only advise that she divorce him immediately. Well, that's somewhat extreme, Doctor. Are you always certain of advice like that? Well, in this case, there's no other answer. I approached Mr. Harmon on the subject last night at his home. I explained that Mrs. Harmon's health, her very life is in jeopardy. And more is involved here than keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. I see. But uh, Mr. Harmon doesn't care for semantics, huh? Uh, he attacked me. If it hadn't been for the assistance of Mrs. Harmon and a servant, he might have choked me to death. When I left, he threatened me. Then you should have called the police. Yes, yes, I thought of that. But look, if, if you approached Harmon in the right manner, Dollar, he might discard his ideas of violence. Well, you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, but the best thing I can see for you is to prefer assault charges and have him locked up. I know all that, but it's for Mrs. Harmon's sake. Please understand, she's been through a shattering ordeal. Look, Mr. Dollar, would you, would you go see him and talk to him? If you think he means it, really, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. <laughs> The Harmon residence was in Westchester, a story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. There was a 51 Cadillac in the open garage and a 52 Ford station wagon in front of the house. Yes? This one didn't have a white coat or stethoscope, but he had a gun. What is it? Mr. Harmon? I'm Harmon. What do you want? Mr. Harmon, my name is Dollar. And Dollar, I'm like... huh? Get out of my way! Oh, Drink this. Easy now. Oh. Take it, please. Oh, you had quite a blow. Try a little more. It should make you feel better. What was... Who... Oh, you, you can bring suit against him. Against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. He's just ungovernable. He could easily have killed you. You, uh, Mrs. Harmon? Yes. Your husband think I was the ice man? Oh, I don't know what he thought. I... I just heard him yell at you, and when I came to the door, you were lying there, and he'd taken the station wagon and left. Why, last night, he even attacked my personal physician and threatened to kill him. I don't know what's gotten into him. You'd better sit down. Oh, that's getting better. Where'd he go? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar, mad. He's liable to do anything. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared stiff. <laughs> I called Dr. Clayton, who promised to notify the police. It was about a quarter to six when I got back to his office. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. Hi. You Dr. Clayton? No. Hey, uh, don't I know you? I was thinking the same about you. Uh, wait, Dollar? Yeah. Tom Bassman, Central Division. Oh, sure. How are you, Tom? Fine. Hey, you must be the one. What? This Dr. Clayton called downtown about a threat, said his insurance company had advised him to report it. That's right. Well, where is he? Well, he should be here, Tom. What's his nurse say? I rang the buzzer. No one around at all. What's this all about? A man named Benjamin Harmon's threatened the doctor's life. I met him myself. He's carrying a gun, and he looked dangerous to me. I just came from his house. He's still there? No. I better phone in and get a pickup out on him. When the doctor shows up, I'll get a complaint. 
Oh, hello. Hello. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Stevens. Dr. Clayton here? This is Sergeant Bassman. We want to see him ourselves. You're a police officer? That's right, miss. I heard him talking to you on the phone. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, goodness, he sent me out to pick up these things. He was here when I left. Oh. What? Perhaps he had an emergency. Well, is there any way we can find out? Well, if he had one, it would be right here on the pad, because I always have to know... Hmm. That's funny. What? He got an emergency call, 1213 Alessandro Street. Can I see that, please? Uh Uh-huh. There's no name on this, Miss Stebbins. Do you recognize the address at all? No, I don't. The doctor just wouldn't take a random emergency call unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual. Dollar, how bad off did you think Harmon was? Mad. Had a gun. Cracked me. Plenty rough. Mm-hmm. This is in the warehouse district. Think we better go down there? I think so. be that vacant lot over there. This one's 1240 and the rest belong to that warehouse. Yeah. Tom. Hmm? That car. MD on the license plate? Yeah. It might be Clayton's. Yeah. Uh, It's Clayton's car, all right. He must be around here somewhere looking for 1213. Yeah. Well, let's have a peek. Tom. I see. Uh, he's had it. Is it Clayton? Yeah, that's him. Some emergency this was. Yeah. <laughs> Turn to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. On weekends, it seems everybody takes his car out on the highways. Some drivers are less experienced than others. They either speed or poke along with a whole stream of cars behind them. Both types are a menace to safety. Whatever you do, be moderate, be obedient to all traffic laws, be careful, use your head, and don't take chances. With our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. An hour of questioning in the neighborhood turned up two people who recalled hearing the shots. And one man remembered seeing a man who answered Benjamin Harmon's description loitering in the vicinity of a nearby bar earlier in the evening. Obviously, Dr. Clayton had been lured to his death by the murderer who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited till the victim appeared, and then shot him down. Expense account item three, $11.65. A good dinner, three martinis, tip, and thinking at Toot Shores. After which, I strolled over to the Pelroy building. Expense account item four, five dollars even. Bribed watchman. Uh, I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. I appreciate it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. Just looking around is all. Too bad about the doctor. Nice fellow. Very. What do you think you'll find? A policeman been here till almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Sure. Well, what? Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it uh, with him when he went out on that emergency. Yeah, don't be too long. The business about the emergency kit started me thinking. I opened Clayton's file drawer and skimmed through every patient's name from Abbott to Zabrowski. He'd been a thorough man and from all evidences operated an efficient medical office. However, he had no medical history in his files on Florence Harmon. There was nothing to indicate that she had ever been a patient of his. 
On the other hand, there was an entry a year before which showed that he had examined, treated, and discharged Benjamin Harmon as a patient. I think these two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I needed for a while. Nurse Jane Stebbins' home address was duly noted on Dr. Clayton's phone book. Oakdale House. Surprisingly enough, on Oak Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 210. Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I just got home a little while ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Do you want to come in? Thanks. I don't want to keep you up. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straightened it up for days, it seems. I'm sorry. Things like this aren't easy. I know. Don't apologize to me. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Have they caught Mr. Harmon yet? No, not yet. Uh, Miss Stebbins, you worked for Dr. Clayton a long while, didn't you? Five years. Then you should be able to tell me who he was going to marry. Marry? Well, I didn't know. I have no idea. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon. Honeymoon? Look, reservations on the Ile de France for next April. I found them in his desk drawer. Confirmed to Dr. and Mrs. James Clayton. Well? What difference does it make? I don't know. Seems strange that you've been with him for such a long time and didn't know about this. I... Or did you? All right. What about Mrs. Harmon? Well... Look, Miss Stebbins, things are wrong all the way down the line about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll come out sooner or later. I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar, but Mrs. Harmon was the only one Dr. Clayton saw socially. And she, of course, is married. Of course. And the good doctor advised her to get a divorce. He meet her when Mr. Harmon was a patient of his? Yes, that's right. They became friendly. But Mrs. Harmon was never a patient. No, never. Just her husband. What can you tell me about Mr. Harmon? Well, really, all I know is he came in to see Dr. Clayton a few times. Over a year ago, I guess. Then after... After he saw what was happening between Mrs. Harmon and Dr. Clayton, he stopped coming in. I sent a copy of his medical history to another doctor. But Dr. Clayton had been seeing Mrs. Harmon all this time. It's awful to say this now, Mr. Dollar. Doctor's dead. I'm no moralist. We're all human. It's happened before. Married people have been attracted by others. I'm tired, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Do you have any idea why I was called in today? At first, I didn't. I... Well, of course, it happened. The police told me about Mr. Harmon's threats. But I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Harmon, and what does it all mean? It means the wrong man was killed. <laughs> Mr. Dollar. I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Now, look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police looking for Ben. I don't have... You and Clayton. I was going to be the star witness when the state tried him for shooting your husband. Whatever I said as a material witness would back up his self-defense plea and get him off on a justifiable homicide. Isn't that it? I tell you, I won't listen And you and the doctor would sail to France and live happily ever after. What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? You won't listen. Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, I know you know everything, then it must be that way. Yeah, only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your doctor boyfriend after all. Get out of here. Get out of my house. You can't prove anything. You're right, Mrs. Harmon. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. They catch your husband, they'll put him away for it. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Or maybe you didn't really love your doctor after all. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Well, that's it, Sergeant. I want to know if people can really get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law. 
If and when you pick up Benjamin Harmon, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, we'll get him, Dollar. The others, I can't answer. What you just told me is really a thing. I don't see how any lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and finally guns him down, do you? Supposing I could prove that Harmon was being set up as a patsy, that the doctor was really supposed to gun him down and plead self-defense. Up to the judge and the jury. When we get Harmon, he'll be arraigned and indicted on first-degree murder charges. Don't worry about that. And if it goes that far, it generally means you'll get the works. After all, we're pretty sure he shot and killed the doctor. Hang up, Dollar. Huh? You still there, Dollar? Hang up or I'll blow your head off. Benjamin Harmon wasn't kidding. He was blazing mad, he had a gun, and I knew he wasn't afraid to use it. I was across the street when you left my place a little while ago. Fixing up another deal, were you? I don't know what you're talking about, Harmon. I followed you here so we could have this talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let him take you. They'll shoot you down if they see you. Nobody's him. going to shoot me down, not yet. Now, where's your office? Hartford, Connecticut. I mean here. Where do you practice here? Come on. I don't practice anything here. My office is in Hartford. This apartment belongs to a friend of mine. I'm standing in for him here while he's out of town. Where's his office? New York Mutual Liability. I mean his law office. I want to get down there and see how much... Hold on now. I'm not a lawyer. My friend's not a lawyer. We're insurance investigators. Where's the office? I tell you, we... Listen! Clayton called me this morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about divorcing Florence. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there. I think I know why Clayton called you and told you that, but I don't... You and he were trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. You're wrong, Harmon. I didn't know anything about that. Nobody takes my wife away from me. Now, that's the kind of temper that got you in all the trouble you're in. Look, you can shoot me here and I'll be number two. But they'll get you real easy here. You know I didn't kill Clayton? How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people heard you threaten him. I have an idea why you did it, and you might have been right. But murder for any reason... Shut up! You're in on it somewhere. You know who did kill him. And you're going to clear me or I'll rip it out of you, Dollar. Or rip it out of you! Are you crazy? All right. Here. Try this. Go on. I'm tired of fooling with you. Now get on your feet. Well... You got one point in your favor. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No. Here, take another drink. Now, you have a chance to talk to me right now. I don't think the police will be interested in much you have to say. I wanted to kill Clayton, but I didn't. I didn't. Nobody will believe that. I know I've got a temper and I've tried to control it, but I didn't kill him. I'm not impressed with that. I want facts. Where were you when Clayton was shot? How do I know? I didn't know what time he was shot. Say between five and six today. I was out getting mad. Fried. Where? Who saw you? No. After after we met, I was so sore. I jumped in the car and went out and bought myself a jug. I know it sounds crazy, but I spent most of the time just sitting in the car down to the docks, just drinking and thinking and getting mad. I don't know what it was. I don't know when I walked over to the saloon, phoned Clayton. I told him I was on Alessandro Street and to come on down. I wanted to have a showdown. You mean you wanted him to come down so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that on my mind. I don't know. I waited an hour or so, but he never showed up. When I called back at his office, nobody answered. So I climbed back in my car, and that's where I heard about my being wanted for killing him. It was on the newscast. I didn't do it, Dollar. I swear I didn't. The others I knew about, and I didn't kill them. What others? Florence always had other friends. <laughs> yes, I don't love her anymore, but I don't know. Maybe I hate her for all of it. When a man doesn't let part of his life walk away from him. I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her get away with it, it would have been too much for me to hold. Even though... Yes. Even though you didn't love her and... 
You knew she didn't love you? Yes. That sounds stupid. Maybe. I loved her once. She loved me the way two people only love at certain times. Hell, no sense yet. I'm not well, darling. Clayton gave me a year. Another doctor, 18 months. Finished anemia. The two of them could have waited at least till I was dead, couldn't they? Couldn't they? I found some sleeping pills in your medicine cabinet, and I fed him a couple with some hot cocoa. He dropped off to sleep in your bed while I made some phone calls confirming what he just told me. Expense account item five, taxi fare. $4.05 back to Oak Street, to Oakdale House. Special rates for nurses. I thought you'd be back. I'm glad it's you. I think somehow you're the kind of man who understands things. I'll be a good listener. Go ahead. When I first started as his nurse, I fell in love with him. I guess it's an old story. Terribly old and corny. But then he met her. I heard him tell you all those lies today about treating Mrs. Harmon. I was out in the hall. Didn't have any idea exactly what he intended to do until I heard him call Mr. Harmon. Right after you left. He told him you were a lawyer. He knew Harmon was upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about knowing what people would do. I was here when Mr. Harmon called in tonight. Doctor took the call and wrote it down on the pad. I saw him put the gun inside his coat, and I knew he was going down there to shoot Mr. Harmon. So I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Harmon with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy that she wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. He struggled, and the gun went off I don't know how many times. Then I came back here and pretended I'd been down at the drugstore. I see. What's your first name? Jane. Jane, Dr. Clayton made all sorts of elaborate plans so he'd have a self-defense plea. But you don't have to go to all that trouble. You can prove self-defense. He had the gun. He was going to use it on you. I beg your pardon? I can help you, Jane. Jane. It go second degree or manslaughter, suspended. You didn't mean to shoot him, but he meant to shoot you. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. What? I guess they haven't found her yet. I killed Mrs. Harmon an hour ago. <laughs> Expense account item six, same as one, transportation back to Hartford. I didn't spend any other money, Chet. I didn't meet your girl, and I didn't see the musical. I didn't go anyplace. I just sat in your office and looked at the walls for the next three days. I'm leaving this where you'll see it when you come in tomorrow morning. Settle up and don't call me for a long time. A long, long time, if you call at all. Expense account total, $56.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and is written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Joseph Kearns, John McIntyre, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Every Sunday, CBS Radio's Bob Trout brings you a timely weekend roundup of world news. As a special eyewitness feature, an overseas CBS Radio News correspondent flies in to give you an up-to-the-minute account of developments on his beat. 
Don't miss Bob Trout's World News Roundup Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, this is a story that confirms that even with the change of leads, uh, the whole uh, depressing ending is not going to be going away. And this is a classic one with the twist that she just committed a murder, and now she's going to pay for it. In a way, I do think it's kind of an interesting commentary on... Uh, justice, because sometimes, you know, in law, things don't turn out so that everyone gets what they deserve. In this episode, everybody who had something coming got it. The doctor for plotting this murder setup, and the same thing for the wife, and the nurse goes will go to prison for killing the wife, and at the end, no one is happy. That doesn't suggest justice is not worth pursuing, but it does suggest that it perhaps is not enough. I will say the one thing that I think is probably discordant with uh, the way John Lund would play Johnny Dollar going forward is the whole blaming the guy who invited him for everything going wrong. I think that type of thing will see fade away as Lun really gets more into the role. I did also do some research. I checked the newspapers.com for any John Lun news in between the uh, pilot and this episode. The big thing that happened was that he was cast in The Latin Lovers, a big-budget MGM film where he plays a romantic rival to Ricardo Montalban. So I think we know how that one's going to turn out. I'm not even a woman, and I know how that's going to turn out. Nothing against John Lund, but I think there are few men who could believably be written as winning the girl from... Ricardo Montalban. But you don't even have to think about the title or how the casting shows up on the poster. But I th think we're pretty all sure of the outcome. I'd mentioned previously that Lun had been doing a lot of outside movies, so this had to be a relief to get some film where he was going to be working more indoors and on a big budget film. Now we turn to some listener comments and feedback. And uh, we have a comment, a couple comments from YouTube. Gwendolyn writes, I have a problem sleeping at night, so I put in my earbuds so I won't keep my husband awake. I'll listen to your program and it entertains me, keeps me from feeling frustrated because pain keeps me awake. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gwendolyn. And I hope uh, you feel better. Glad we're able to help a little bit with that. And Larry says, great comfort to listen instead of overtaxing eyes as 85% of people do. Highest number of eye strain and brain drain among younger and younger people. Well, thanks so much. Uh, glad to uh, provide that option. And then uh, also a comment on Facebook. This one from Jack. Love the show. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you, Jack. And I also want to go ahead now and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Wendy, Patreon supporter since May of 2019, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Well, that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it uh, wherever you get your podcasts from. And join us back here tomorrow for The Silent Men. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Instagram at instagram.com slash greatdetectives 
And check out our Discord server over at greatdetectives.net slash chat. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.